Please help support the channel by visiting our Amazon store, affiliate link below. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Matt Jarbo. This is Three Buck Theater and today is September 20th, 2017. We're just two days away from the release of Kingsman, The Golden Circle, a movie I have been waiting for since they announced it back in 2015. I can't wait to go back into that world just because as big of a comic book movie fan as I am, I felt Kingsman, The Secret Service was just one of those ones that, that kind of hit every note that it needed to hit. It was new, it was fresh, it was violent, it was original, it was funny. It was brutal, it was hysterical, it was all of these things kind of rolled into one. Never mind the fact that the church scene, Rockin' Freebird, was the best use of the song and probably one of the most intricate scenes, I would say probably the most intricate scene that Matt Vaughn has ever directed, and I can't wait to see the sequel tomorrow night, so definitely look for my review there. But speaking of comic book movies, the first one I want to touch upon today is Logan. More importantly, Wolverine. But first, let's talk about Logan. So in an interview with uh, with Variety, Fox CEO Stacey Snyder was, well, asked a question about Logan. Uh, and first they were asking about whether or not they would recast a younger Logan. And he says anything's really a possibility. Now, we know that Fox wants to reboot Logan. We know this because, well, they need to at this point. Wolverine has been around for 17 years with the same actor. That reign is now over. They're still trying to find a, a way to use the character to make him more popular than ever before, although that's probably not going to happen considering the love of Hugh Jackman in that particular role. But it's one that they're going to wait on a couple of years. And it makes sense. They don't want to force it. Not, not when we're coming off the heels of Logan, you know, just within a year. It, it just feels like it would completely crap on the legacy and crap on the work that Hugh Jackman did, that James Mangold did, that everyone involved with the film and the films did. It's one of those ones where it's like, look, it, he had his run. It, it ended perfectly. It ended horrifically sad. I was tearing up in the theater. But it definitely had a good end and one that we all can live with. But there's there's another little bit there that I find to be interesting. And it was uh, talking about the, the possibility of Logan being an Oscar contender and that Stacey Snyder was like, yeah, sure. No, it should be an Oscar contender, which is one of the things I find to be interesting considering the fact that Fox has chosen to pursue war of the planet of the apes or war for the planet of the apes as its best pick contender versus Logan. Now, I don't quite know why. I haven't seen War for the Planet of the Apes yet, uh, but I've heard great things about it. It looked spectacular from the previews. The reviews all said it was great. All my friends who saw it loved it. But man, I went and saw Logan twice opening weekend. One of those times was in IMAX. I own the damn Blu-ray. I've watched it a couple times. I love this movie. And to me, it just gets better the more and more I watch it. To me, this is something that absolutely utterly screams Best Picture nomination or at least Best Actor nomination. But when it comes to the Oscars, it's all about money. You know, money talks, BS walks. That's the whole name of the game. And if Fox is not going to put their time, effort, and money into a solid marketing campaign for Logan to be picked up for any nomination across the board, then then it's just not going to go anywhere. That is unless the Academy with its new members is all of a sudden like, yeah, I really, really, really like Logan and they want to go that route. But they're not going to because that's not the way the game is played. So I find it a little bit disingenuous that Stacey Snyder is like, oh, yeah, and Logan should totally get awards when they're not actively doing anything they can to push it. Don't get me wrong. Matt Reeves movies are generally good. Uh, and, and the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was fantastic. And, and this one looks, you know, the sequel looks just as good. So I can understand why Fox wants to push that. I get it. I haven't, like I said, I haven't seen it, but it's on my list of things to see when it hits Blu-ray. And I get it. But I feel like they're taking the wrong, you know, they're, they're, they're really taking the wrong approach here. Maybe they're trying to push war for the planet of the apes uh, because they want to keep Matt Reeves around after, you know, after Batman. Maybe they they want to continue working with him. They know that Hugh Jackman's not coming back. Is James Mangold going to pick up another movie? Is he going to do X-23? What's going to happen with any of those things? We don't know any of that, any of that stuff yet. That hasn't been talked about. But Logan should get the attention it deserves when it comes to award season. And if Fox isn't going to back that financially and make that play financially or make that commitment financially, then they shouldn't even be talking about it because all it does is just send this wave of confusion through the industry. Yeah, the CEO of 20th Century Fox should not be telling uh, interviewers that he thinks Logan should win awards. Not if that's the movie that they're not going to push. 
And I know that may seem odd to some people out there, but if they want to win, and let's face it, every studio wants to win, it's a unified front for which film they pick for Best Picture. If they're going out there saying, oh yeah, no, we're going to push this movie, but this one's really, really, really good too, it confuses... It will confuse the 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 the, uh, the academy members, uh, mostly because a lot of them are old, for one. So they're very sticklerish when it comes to you know how they do things. You have the new players that have come into the game that maybe fully don't understand how it works because of the big diversity push. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to knock on that. I actually feel like more people voting on the academy uh, is probably a lot better. Like in the case of the Golden Globes, Golden Globes is only like nine people or ninety people vote. Uh, from the foreign uh, Hollywood Foreign Press Association, or whatever the hell it is. All right. Unlike the Academy, which is like 6,000 6, plus. So there's a whole bunch of different people who are going to be able to tie in on this. And I, I'm kind of jumping all over the place here, and I apologize. But to me, Logan is the best film I've seen all year. It evoked the most emotion. It had it had just a satisfying end to Hugh Jackman playing that part. And it was it was one of the best Westerns we've gotten in a long damn time. It deserves the recognition it deserves that kind of praise. And it, it saddens me that the studio is almost kind of like lumping it out there. Yeah, yeah, it deserves it too, but we're not going to back it. If you're not going to back it, then please just just don't don't push it. Because all it's going to do is just make people question your choices for who you want to back to be the victor anyway. All right, so jumping over into Star Wars news, that's not necessarily like movie news, but just kind of behind the scenes drama. That's a little interesting to talk about. Apparently, Paramount Pictures is pretty pissed off that J.J. Abrams is directing Star Wars Episode 9 and not doing a movie for them. Now, this all has to do with an overall deal that J.J. signed with Paramount a while back, where he was paid approximately $10 million a year in order to develop and produce films for the studio, directing some of them. He directed Super 8, Mission Impossible 3, uh, both of the Star Trek movie, well, the first two Star Trek movies, producing the Cloverfield films that have come out, and a number of other movies through Paramount and Bad Robot. And they figured after, you know, Force Awakens, they kind of gave him that one because it's Force Awakens. Like, why wouldn't he go over to do it? They kind of they kind of were hoping that his next directorial film would be uh, would be would be would be with Paramount. And uh, the new guy running Paramount's not not too happy that uh, this deal has <laughs> has happened. So uh, basically, from what I was reading here, I wouldn't be surprised if Paramount actually goes to Disney and it's like, you owe us you owe us some money. You owe, you owe us some money here. We paid for your boy. We paid, we paid him first. He, we own him right now. Yeah, I could be, I could imagine clearly not as mob mentality ish as that, but you know, something along those lines. And here's the deal. Here's the deal with that is Disney will pay it for one. They'll pay it because JJ is a safe bet. As I talked about in my video, uh, in, in, in an episode when I brought up JJ taking over, when it comes to everything involving Star Wars, uh, and especially after the, the hoopla that has surrounded episode nine with Carrie Fisher's demise and Colin Trevorrow leaving, as well as the Han Solo movie, Disney wants a safe bet. Kathleen Kennedy wants a safe bet. And so if it requires them to pay out a couple million dollars to Paramount in order to keep them from raising a stink about JJ coming over to handle episode nine's directorial duties, they're going to do it. Why? Because it's, it's better for them in the long run. It's way better for them in the long run. And Paramount's probably hoping that they will do that. They're probably absolutely hoping that they will definitely, definitely, definitely pay them some money. Why? Because Paramount freaking needs it. They freaking need it. The last night, or Transformers, the last night bombed. Paramount's mother, which just came out last weekend, bombed. They are not getting big movies. They just, they have not had a win in a while. And at this point, a lot of people are kind of going, why? What the hell is going on at Paramount? Well, hopefully this new guy in charge will be able to kind of right the ship, but this is a big thing. JJ being part of the Paramount family is a big thing. And so him, you know, kind of, met, you know, effing off to go to go do Star Wars does leave them a little bit in a lurch, essentially. But to be fair, JJ's movies combined have grossed $5.7 billion at the box office. So it's not like the dude won't come back and make a movie for you eventually. But look, at the same time, Paramount is actually not... Uh, they're, 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 they're actually, they understand it's, they, they do understand. That's the interesting thing here. They understand that, uh, it's, it's, you know, you don't get a twice in a lifetime opportunity to go and direct star Wars. Like you just don't like, they understand why he went to go do it. Like the creatives get it. But at the same time, it's like, well, we're paying you 10 million a year. 
we kind of expect some stuff from you. So if you're going to be poached by another company, that company maybe, 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 maybe want to pony up some dough. And I think they're going to, because like I said before, it's just better for business that they do. Okay, so Kingsman Golden Circle drops in a couple days, and there's already talk of a third and final film to that trilogy. In fact, this has been something that has been ongoing in Matthew Vaughn's mind since they started working on the first movie way back when. And we don't know for certain what's going to happen. We don't know for certain what's going to go down with box office this weekend, which is a little bit odd considering that it has been absolutely smashing it. Okay, it's done 300 some plus worldwide at this point. Uh, I mean, over, I think roughly around 200 million here in the United States, if not over, I don't have the exact number in front of me. And it's going into its third weekend where it is going up against Kingsman, the Golden Circle and the Lego Ninjago movie. Now, Lego Ninjago, I do feel is going to probably take home the top spot, but the number two spot it is possible to get go to it. It's really possible that it could go to it simply because it is having such a, a, a rush at the box office that, yes, it's going to drop. But is it going to drop enough to, to fall underneath Kingsman and fall underneath Lego Ninjago? I don't know. I think Ninjago is going to pull it in mostly due to the success of the Lego Batman movie from back in February. Never mind the uh, the Lego movie from from back in 2014. Uh, those movies tend to do well. It's coming out at a time where there hasn't been a kids film for a while. Kids are back in school, but they still want to go to the movies. And as we've learned from beforehand, we know that movies will do well in off peak months. So in non summer months. Right. But back on the subject of Kingsman here, uh, when talking with Colin Firth but in the early discussions for Kingsman, Firth has said that, yes, there was always going to be three films. That was the original discussion. He just hadn't mapped it out yet. Jeff Bridges is basically saying roughly the same thing, saying that they're jamming on ideas, but there's no script yet. Um, and so he's always envisioned it as a trilogy, this being Matthew Vaughn. So we know that there's probably going to be a third movie. Right. And I guess a lot of it does depend on how much Kingsman Golden Circle makes. But let's be but let's be realistic here. Kingsman Secret Service was basically an independently financed movie. Matthew Vaughn does independently financed films. He can get the money because he, his vision as a director is well received in Hollywood. His vision as a director is well regarded, well loved, well, well respected in Hollywood, and he has a very dedicated subset of fans. If you heard Matthew Vaughn was directing something or producing something, you're probably going to be like, yeah, no, 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 I'm in. I'm in. I want to see it. I, I I, don't even care what it is at this point. He could direct like a freaking Clorox commercial, and you're like, you know, it's probably going to be the best Clorox commercial of all time. It's going to probably be great. I mean, look at this dude's track record. All right. You got Kick-Ass. My right? Kick-Ass for 2010 when it came out was, again, such a breath of fresh air concerning uh, superhero movies. It, it took it to a darkly comedic, violent place that, yes, Kick-Ass 2 tried to replicate, failed in a few ways. I still enjoyed it, but I understand why others didn't. You've got X-Men First Class, which had such a rushed development. The fact that it was as good as it was has everything to do with Matthew Vaughn coming on and busting it out. you got one of my personal favorites, Stardust from 2007, which is a masterful uh, adaptation of Neil Gaiman's book. Uh, so much so that they even went back in and they added in more of Robert De Niro's pirate Shakespeare because he was such a good, he did such a good job. And if case you've never heard of Stardust and you want to go check it out, it stars Charlie Cox, who went on to go play Matt Murdock in Daredevil. So it's before then, before the gruff, you know, New York exterior, it's him in kind of a romantic comedy. Um, and there's also Layer Cake, which Layer Cake was very good too. Um, and, and Vaughn does, does good movies. He does, he does great films. So I really want to see what he does here. I really want to see what happens to Kingsman. I'm going to be there tomorrow night, as I mentioned before, and I'm hoping we get to see a third one because movies like this need to be made. Movies like this that challenge the, the status quo of the current comic book genre need to be made. We're, we're already just as a quick little side thing. We're at five years since dread was released. That's sad. Five years ago, dread came out like this week five years ago. And as a result of that, comic book movies, comic book adaptations going R-rated, going a little darker, have done well in some respects. But, you know, they have dread to think for a lot of it. And I just wish, you know, I don't know, I kind of I kind of view my support of this as kind of like my support of another dread movie. You know, like, where, are we going to get another dread film? The answer to that is absolutely not. Are we going to get a Mega City 1 TV series with Carl Urban as dread? Yeah, that's a possibility. But by supporting stuff like this, it gives those kind of creators 
the drive to push their vision forward for these sorts of things. And for that, I am 100% on board with. So yes, Kingsman 3, I'm on board. Kingsman 2, I'm there this weekend. And I urge you guys all to go do the same. All right, so jumping over into Justice League news, because I feel everything I talk about these days is pretty much just comic book stuff, because that's what's really big. But jumping over into Justice League news, BatmanNews.com says they can confirm that Jesse Eisenberg's scenes as Lex Luthor in Justice League have been cut. They have given no other explanation of this. They just said they have sources who have seen an early audience test screening and can confirm that Jesse Eisenberg had his version or his scenes cut from the movie, which is interesting to me because that does somewhat suggest a number of things. One, it is, you know, one of the many different types of test screenings where they're going to test probably maybe one or two different versions of the film to see what works, to see what doesn't. Maybe they're just testing this one without Jesse Eisenberg scenes to see if audiences have any trouble connecting the dots. Given the fact that Eisenberg's Lex Luthor was a big, big, big part of BVS, especially a big part of connecting Steppenwolf to coming to Earth that is going to be the main antagonist of Justice League, you figure having him there would make sense. At the same time, at the end, when he was in the, you know, in, in the insane asylum, essentially, and he was saying that you can't unring that bell, and we have that scene of him giving Steppenwolf a mother box, we know that that part's already been established. But if you are someone out there who hasn't seen the Batman Extended Cut or Batman v Superman Extended Cut and have only seen the horrible, horrible theatrical version, you don't, you know, you're not going to recognize this. Like, you're not going to get that scene. So having something like that to establish the connection between BVS and Justice League would only make sense. So there's that. The other idea here is that um, basically Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon was brought in at the end of March or middle to the end of March, essentially to work on uh, rewriting uh, parts of Justice League in order to have the summer reshoots. And of course, Zack Snyder had the family tragedy and he bailed out, uh, I mean, completely understandably. And Joss Whedon came on in. And so we don't know what Whedon has tweaked. We don't know what changes there are going to be for this movie. We have no idea what's been added, what's been cut, what's been altered, we won't know yet. And it's entirely possible that uh, any mention of Lex Luthor, any connection to Lex Luthor, is something that Whedon just took out. Maybe he didn't like Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal of the character. Maybe he didn't have any usable info, you know, footage to, to put it in there during the final edit of the film to make it work. We don't know. But the movie comes out in two months and and these are some these are this is a big a big omission from the film in my opinion. It's a big omission from the movie simply because Jesse Eisenberg, Lex Luthor, is a key player. He was a key player in Batman v Superman, being a key player going forward into Justice League. At least if it's gonna like maybe kind of tie into like the the Legion of Doom or something. Him being a part of this is something that should be there in one way or another. And if they cut him out, there's. They better have a really good reason. If not, they're going to screw their continuity. But at this point, given the fact that the Flash's first film is Flashpoint, and we're hearing now that uh, Gal Gadot is going to have a cameo appearance in Flashpoint, they're kind of throwing it all up in the air anyway. And so it's one of those things where you're like, well, we'll just have to wait and see. And that is never a good sign when you're trying to build an extended cinematic universe like this, right? Okay, and finally tonight, I got a little bit a little bit more information on the Edge of Tomorrow 2. Well, you could call it Edge of Tomorrow 2 or Live, Die, Repeat, and Repeat. And this is currently where Doug Lyman is having a little bit of problems with Warner Brothers as a whole. Uh, in a recent interview, he was talking about the film itself and how he was hoping, he is hoping, to rebrand Edge of Tomorrow as Live, Die, Repeat. Which if you go and you buy the movie on home video, as you have been now for almost three years, it's been Live, Die, Repeat. But pretty much everybody knows it as Edge of Tomorrow. All right. If you ask somebody out there, what's that Tom Cruise movie with him in a mech suit? And they'll be like, uh, that Edge of Tomorrow movie. They, they, they may go live, die, repeat if they found the film on home video, which there are a number of people who have. But again, that was some weird screw up in branding. I understand why Doug Lyman wants to rebrand it because he wants the sequel to be, as I said, live, die, repeat and repeat. And that <laughs> that ties into the story that him and Tom Cruise are currently working on which uh, basically has him once again repeating the same day over and over again. 
Now, Warners, and this is where, again, they've had a little bit of kind of back and forth here. Warners has said, well, can you, can you, can, can he just go off and fight the aliens? Does, does he, does he, does he need to do the whole time repeat thing again? Could, could we just not Groundhog Day the hell out of this? You know, and then no, Doug Lyman's like, no, 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 this is part of the story. All right. So the part of the story essentially is he goes, he repeats the day, but he goes back in time. All right. So he's going back in time. Now, what does this tell you? And that's, by the way, that's, that's all the info we have on the story, but I can speculate as to what I think is going to happen because it just makes sense. So in edge of tomorrow or live, I repeat, I, I prefer edge of tomorrow, uh, which I get the terminology there. I get the meaning of the title lived. I repeat sounds cool, but also so does the title of the original manga, which is all you need is kill. So yeah, again, branding in this case has been a problem from the get go. But in the original, he, you know, uh, he got blood of an alpha on him, all right? And they needed to go and take out the Omega in order to, you know, reset the timeline and continue it going forward, at least for him. That being said, if they then find a way to capture, uh, what I'm going to assume is that there's going to be like another Omega or something, and they're going to need to probably go back in time uh, further to uh, fight the alien invasion, like, or stop the alien invasion before it begins. Something along those lines. That just, to me seems like the best course of action that to me seems like probably what's going to be the 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 how they're going to present the story uh they they want to do that uh probably because it's the easier way of continuing you can't sit there and have a have a you know have a sequel that has both him and rita uh fighting aliens in another you know repeating day fashion it would just be a rehash of the same thing that being said, they could do a prequel with just Rita in her day going back over it again, time and time and time again, until she lost all the blood. And then that ties into the first movie. And I think audiences would be very happy with that. Also, we get to see Emily Blunt kick more ass. And that's good for everyone who likes to watch movies. But this is a Tom Cruise movie. It's going to have Tom Cruise. It's going to have Tom Cruise. And it's probably not going to have Emily Blunt because they have to find a very interesting way to tie her into it. Uh, unless they do. I don't know. I don't know if her contract is up for that. I'm not too sure what's going on with that. I know she's working on the Mary Poppins Returns right now, and I, I'm not too sure what else she's got going on. But uh, it's, you know, Doug Lyman says him and Tom make movies for the long term, and they want to make movies that, you know, that can stick around for a while. And I think them going further back to stopping the alien invasion is probably what they're going to have to do. Maybe going and finding when the first landing party or the first scout party comes to earth they go back to when that happens and they fight all of them like that's maybe going to be what happens we'll have to wait and see so far <laughs> so far there's no real movement on this movie in terms of a production start date or even a script being completed or even tom cruise saying yeah it's gonna happen it's just speculatory and it's cool because i love the movie but Tom Cruise ain't getting any younger, and as we know from his Mission Impossible 6 stunt, he can break some stuff, break his ankles, which, you know, delays that production by a couple weeks. And, uh, you know, we, we don't know what else is going to happen the older he gets, so they're going to have to very much push this thing through uh, as fast as possible before Tom Cruise gets to be too old. But at the same time, try telling Tom Cruise that, and he'll just sit there and strap himself to a plane and do his own stunt that way as more of a middle finger than anything else. All right, guys, that wraps up this episode of Three Buck Theater. My name is, of course, Matt Jarbo. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me and talking about movies and stuff. Be sure to leave your comments below. Thumbs up the video as it does really help with the YouTube algorithm. So does commenting, actually probably more so than that. If you have any interesting stories you guys want to share with me, you can do so down below. Or I have a Discord for everything that is Monday and Matt and Matt Jarbo related. Link below in the video description as well. I will talk to you guys later. Have yourself a fantastic day and peace out.